Okay, good to see you all. A um, couple people will be joining us as time goes on. Uh, so, uh, Sheila, if you'd like to put up the prayers, probably most of you don't need them by now, but we're going to, uh, as is tradition at the beginning of the teaching, take refuge and generate bodhicitta. Sometimes during teachings, um, uh, with the Dalai Lama, for instance, one also recites the Heart Sutra to eliminate you know, obstructions, uh, but we don't, as we're talking about emptiness anyway, we don't necessarily have to do that. Sangi churang soki chognam la jang chu bardu dagni kepsu chi dagi chushe chunyan gipe sognam ki drola penchu sangi drupa shod. I go for refuge until I am a Buddha. Until I'm enlightened, Jangshu Bardu, uh, through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a, a Buddha in order to benefit all migrators. Sange Churang Soki Chognam La, Jangshu Bardu Dagni Kapsu Chi, Dagi Chunen Gipe Sognam Ki, Drola Penche Sange Dupa and then a short mandala. So what you do is you imagine, well, you could start with your surroundings, your yard extending out to the countryside or the city, uh, the whole earth, and then extending to the sun and the moon in our solar system, um, all of the good things By offering this ground anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, sun and moon, visualized as a Buddha realm, may all migrators enjoy a pure realm. O holy and perfect Lama, O holy and perfect pure Lama, from the clouds of compassion that form in the skies, of your dharmakaya wisdom, the dharmakaya like of the like the non-conceptual space, spaciousness of the mind, clear light nature of the mind, please release a rain of vast and profound dharma, precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Idam Guru Rana Mandala Kam Niryatayami. And then sitting comfortably with your spine straight. So I'd like legs comfortable if you need to change them. Relax your body, relax your mind. While comfortable, just recognize your breathing without controlling it. Once recognized, hold it with the mental factor mindfulness. Recognizing when you're breathing in as opposed to breathing out. Recognizing when there is a long breath as opposed to a short breath.
when your mind is a bit relaxed, switch your attention to the contents of your mental consciousness at first. What you've been thinking. Thoughts about the past, the future. Thoughts about the present, judging, recognizing what's happening. Maybe the presence of afflictions or virtuous states of mind. All of those contents are like temporary clouds within the otherwise clear light nature of your mind. Letting go of your attention to them. Try to focus on that subjective nature of the mind that's perceiving them. In which there are no conceptions. It's not something that has a color or shape. It's just the, in this case, just the mere non-affirming negation, the absence of any obstruction of the mental consciousness to the arisal or reabsorption of contents into the mental consciousness. I say reabsorption doesn't mean that if you are thinking of an apple, that the apple absorbs into your mental consciousness, but your mental image of that when not attended to disappears like a cloud in the in a summer sky when the sun shines on it the cloud doesn't go somewhere it absorbs back into the atmosphere Remembering this conventional clear light nature called our conventional Buddha potential, developmental Buddha potential. Even before we realize have a, an, an appreciation for the ultimate Buddha nature, the non-abiding Buddha nature, the emptiness of the mind, merely realizing the conventional nature of the of the of the mind gives us confidence that we can develop good qualities that we lack. We can get rid of the, of the faults that we recognize, even faults that we now think of as qualities. <laughs> Once we recognize they're actually destructive, we can let go of those. We can apply antidotes and remove them from our mind. The fact that we can do this right now, we can appreciate this fact and feel some joy that we have this Buddha potential is because of this auspicious moment, what the Buddha called this auspicious moment of a rebirth of freedom and richness freedom and endowments. We're free from the eight unfree states where there's no chance to practice the Dharma, birth in hell, and it's a Prada, a long life God, and so forth. And we have all the necessary cooperative conditions, the 10 richnesses that allow us to practice and make realizations. It doesn't, among those is not the richness of having a big bank account or having a family, famous family name or something like that. 
but faith in the Dharma, having a, a sound body and mind. When the Buddha head descended to the earth, turned the wheel of Dharma and those teachings still exist, spiritual friends that help us actualize that and a community of sponsors also that help the cooperative conditions. We can use this life of leisure and endowment for the first time in a long time, maybe many, many eons ago, we, we attempted the Buddhist path to develop renunciation or bodhicitta and it petered out after some time. We can use it now to begin a progression that we will like to continue from life to life till we actually develop renunciation, bodhicitta, the right view of emptiness, so that we ourselves can find real peace of mind and so that we can be a resource for all living beings who have been our mother numberless times, have been depthlessly kind, and are still floundering in cyclic existence without those factors that we have, the faith, the contact with teachers and the scriptures and practice and so forth, to be able to extricate mother sentient beings out of cyclic existence and place them in everlasting happiness, stable happiness that doesn't change when we encounter good things and then happiness that disappears when we lose those conditions, but constant happiness permanent happiness. In order to do that, we ourselves have to become a Buddha. And in order to do, that, to do that, we need to collect, to accumulate the two collections of merit and wisdom, which up till now, maybe a couple of years ago, we had no idea what they were. So to listen to the text today, the teachings on Lama Sokapa's commentary, Omba Rapsel, commenting on Chandrakirti's Majamaka Atara, which itself was a meaning commentary of Nargajuna's fundamental wisdom, which itself was a commentary on the Buddhist teachings on emptiness in the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. We listen to this in order to understand how to collect, how to accumulate merit and wisdom. For that goal, we're in the accumulation stage, like the path of accumulation, accumulating the needed factors, knowledge, merit, wisdom, so that we can eventually realize emptiness convention uh, conceptually and eventually have a direct realization of emptiness. Even His Holiness in His great humility saying so many times in recent years that he's hoping to achieve the path of preparation this lifetime as though, you know, just to have a union of calm abiding and penetrative insight, realizing emptiness on the Bodhisattva path. That could be our goal also. So I'm going to listen, participate, contemplate the meanings and meditate when necessary, when possible, for the sake of accumulating the two collections, for the sake of becoming a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. And then bring your attention back to the present. Uh, you can see if you can set out a, a similar, uh, you know, game plan <laughs> uh, yourself 
for your life. You know, this is this is what my game plan for this life is. Uh, not necessarily to uh, become an Olympian uh, in sports or a math wizard or uh, to join the Fortune 500 or something like that, but to, uh, you know, game plan of what you're going to use this life for in, in a Dharma sense to make it really meaningful. Okay. So uh, before we begin, um, just greetings to a couple of you who came. Zumbash, Snehi Aida, Rocio, Paul, Amy Krantz is here for a while. And uh, anyone have a Dharma with a Dharma itch that you'd like some Dharma mine lotion that was coined by uh, Richard when we were talking about I was saying like chamomile. Is it chamomile or chamomile? I, I can't hear you. Well, I believe it's calamine lotion. Calamine. So dharma mine lotion when you have cal calamine lotion for uh, poison ivy or whatever. So um, Suvash, you look like you might have a question. No? No? Okay. Everyone okay? Okay, so I'd like to begin with a little uh, motivation that Geshe Zopa gave. Maybe Paul was there at the time. Uh, July 18th, 2002. Wow, more than 21 years ago. When Geshe was teaching this uh, sixth chapter, this sixth Bhumi in the Gompa Rapsal. So he said, uh, Aryadeva, uh, he's quoting Aryadeva's 400 stanzas, which we've been talking about before. You remember the 400 stanzas? Let me just get this. Uh, here. there we go. Um, the text, Aryadeva was, a, in a sense, the principal disciple of Nargajuna, right? He was, he was his companion as kind of aide-de-camp, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so understood, Nargajuna and Arya Deva are considered by everyone as being nonpartisan uh, expounders of emptiness. Nonpartisan, so they're not considered to be Svatantrika or Prasankika. They're just the, 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 you know, reliable sources. So there was a, a stanza that says, Sipe sabon namshe te, which literally sounds like uh, the, the the seed of sipa. Sipa is uh, what we what we can we can call it as uh, existence, or we can call it cyclic existence. Generally, it's a synonym of samsara, right? So the seed sipe sabon namshe te. Namshe means consciousness. So almost sounds like uh, consciousness is itself the seed of cyclic existence, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, here, the um, Geshe said, our sabon, our, our seed or primary cause of samsara is namshe, consciousness. Generally, namshe means any consciousness, but here, sipe sabon namshe te means uh, to the consciousness which holds things as truly existent, that grasps wrongly, you know, that believes in that appearance of true existence or inherent existence, it, it refers to, so this namshe here re refers to not all consciousness, but to, to ignorance. One might think to interpret it like Chittimatra view that that consciousness is has the seed of cyclic existence in it or something like that. But here it's, uh, Aryadeva was meaning that it refers to ignorance. The primary cause of individual samsaric impure life is this kind of consciousness, this ignorance. And the second line says, yul nam de chuyulo. So yul, yul means maybe those who've studied uh, when we talked about mind and metal factors or so forth, yul means object, yul nam means plural, objects. 
they truly low. Those objects are its true you. They're they're it their uh, sphere of the uh, of uh, experience. The objects that ignorance are what takes cognizance of those objects. Yula dagme tongnani. Dagme means uh, selfless. Tongwa means see. If one sees the selflessness in those objects, sipe sabon gakbargyur, the seed of existence will be ceased, will be overcome. So I, just let me read a little of, of Geshe's words. Yulnam, every subject, object. So when we say yul, usually means objects, but subjects, consciousnesses are also the objects of some other consciousness. We can look at our own consciousness in terms of it being an object, and other people, like the Buddhists, can know our consciousness as being an object. So yulnam, every subject and object, everything, all of them appear in their own way, they appear to be ultimately existent or truly existent. Any kind of object by the power of this ignorance, when we have that ignorance in our in our mind, uh, they appear truly existent, existing in their own way, ultimately. How do you get rid of that kind of ignorance, this primary cause of samsara? Yula dakme tongnani, There is no other way of getting rid of it other than having seen the truth of those. Their selflessness or emptiness. Back mepa, what do we, what do we call it? Selfless. That has to be clearly realized. There are other mental factors, however, that uh, like, for instance, love, bodhicitta, compassion, meditation, many other meritorious virtues um, that help that can subdue the afflictions. It doesn't mean that you that that the only thing to do is to generate wisdom. Uh, it doesn't mean that without wisdom you have no way to get rid of anything. We can get rid of them temporarily by, like I said, we can get rid of our anger temporarily by developing love and compassion and so forth, they were, those are called the temporal antidotes. But the ultimate antidote, the, the magic elixir, uh, is emptiness. Those other practices can temporarily rid us of many. Some of them can reduce or suppress in many ways. But if one wants to get rid from the very beginning, from the very root or the seed, the root fully taking out, you have to realize the opposite, opposite of the root you have to realize selflessness. I'm not going to go. Uh, Geshele gave longer motivation, but we've already done our some prayers and our own motiv motivation, so that should be uh, suffice for today. So last time, we had finished off uh, the beginning section of the sixth Bhumi, and uh, we'd ended up with this quotation from Vasubandhu. Uh, let's see, just so that you know where you are. Uh, it's on Jimpa page 171, if you have the hard copy that we're going to start today. And Anne Klein's uh, Path to the Middle, I guess it's called, uh, page 163. So right before that, not just the pages before that, there was a uh, the last thing, there was a quote from Vasubandhu, who was the author of the Abhidharma Kosha and the author of his own auto-commentary to it, the Abhidharma Kosha, Basham. He's, uh, in, in Jimpa's uh, translation, he has, therefore, those who expound the Dharma inaccurately and expound it with afflicted mind, mind yearning for gifts, honor, and fame, they will undermine their own great store of merit. Or as Anne said, more or less the same. Therefore, persons who explain the doctrine erroneously or who having an, 
having an afflicted mind, explain it out of desire for good services or fame. Usually in Tibetan, we say kurti. Uh, they will cause a large amount of their own merit to degenerate. So that's where we finished last time. So now we're going to begin this next section uh, that Jimpa labels as nine, identifying the object of negation. Uh, that's Jimpa's own creative name uh, that actually comes a little bit later. Uh, this section is, uh, and calls it dependent arising in reality. So, um, this has the way suchness of dependent origination is expounded. That's the actual title of this outline. The way suchness of dependent origination is expounded. This has three parts, three sections. How this is presented in the perfect scriptures. How the meaning of the scriptures how the meaning of the scriptures is established by reason. Or as Anne says, establishing the meaning of scripture through reasoning. And Jimpa says, enumerations of emptiness, colon, the established conclusion, which I don't think is a uh, sort of a just doesn't give justice to the meaning there and translates it as explaining the divisions of emptiness so established. It doesn't mean established conclusion. Anyway, that's it. That's another thing. Established conclusion is something usually when we say in the Tibetan scriptures, do you know what that is, Paul? What, what do we translate often? Uh, tenants. Yeah, yeah. Established conclusion or... Uh, Maybe tachu. Uh, mm, oh, so uh, tachu, decisive analysis. Yeah, a sort of analysis of the, the it, so when you're coming to a conclusion or something like that. Um, so Jimpa says, how this is presented in the, in the perfect scriptures. That's the first section we're talking about. This has two parts. Citations showing how it, it was taught in the scriptures. How what was taught. Right? How reality, or as, as uh, Anne says, how reality is set out in the scriptures. Uh, Jim just says citations showing how it was taught in the scriptures. So this is talking about how reality or the ultimate reality is taught in the scriptures. And then two, identifying the forces opposing the understanding of suchness. So suchness is another synonym of ultimate reality, right? So uh, Jimpa says, uh, citations showing how it was taught in the scriptures. Here in the Ten Grounds Sutra, Dashabhumika, it states, when the Bodhisattva on the fifth ground enters the sixth ground, so obviously someone who is on the fifth ground when they're going to meditative equipoise at the end of that, and they've eliminated the uh, obstructions to, uh, or, or say they, they, they've, they've eliminated that which is to be eliminated by the fifth ground entirely, they enter into the sixth ground. So when a bodhisattva on the fifth ground enters the sixth ground, uh, they do so by means of 10 perfect equanimities, is that what he says? Equanimities, or as Anne calls them, ten samenessness. Sameness, samenesses, samenesses. So nyampa ni. Nyampa means equal, or you could say same. Um, so you can choose what resonates better with your mind, which, which makes more sense. You talk about the ten equanimities, with respect to phenomena or the 10 samenessnesses of phenomena. Uh, then uh, what are the 10? They are uh, the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of signs. I could say the, the, uh, the, the sameness. All phenomena are the same in uh, being signless. 
the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of defining characteristics, or as Anne says, uh, being characterless. Um, likewise, so those first two are set aside. Likewise, three in their absence of birth in be and, and four in being unborn, or as Anne says, likewise in being productionless, absence of birth. So it doesn't mean um, birth from a, you know, like a human necessarily. It means uh, uh, giving birth or production of something that, that phenomena uh, have no inherently existent generation or birth or production. All phenomena, um, so likewise, and says, likewise, all phenomena, likewise in being productionless, non-produced, void, pure from the very beginning, without elaborations of inherent existence, and non-adopted and non-discarded. So let's see what Jimpa says, uh, three, in their absence of birth, in being unborn, five, in being void, six, in their prim primordial purity, and seven, in their freedom from elaborations. So that's that we'll be going into detail about what these mean in a, in a minute. So when we talk about freedom from elaborations, it's a common expression uh, in the scriptures. Elaborations, generally we have different kinds of elaborations in our mind when we have uh, you know, conceptual thought, thinking about things, we elaborate about them. Here the elaborations are talking about uh, conceptual thoughts that are imputing some kind of inherent existence on things. So as Anne puts in parentheses, without the elaborations of inherent existence. And Jimpa says, uh, eight, the perfect equanimity in their absence of affirmation and rejection. That means, uh, as, as Anne says, what is that, that phenomena are uh, non-adopted and non-discarded. That means phenomena that are taken up uh, that, that that are yeah taken up in practice like pursuing virtue and so forth they're not inherently that and those things that are discarded or rejected um, things that you want to avoid and so forth are not inherently that way and then nine the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their resemblance to these four famous illusions, uh, four famous analogies. Illusions, all phenomena are equal in that they resemble illusions, dreams, mirages, or more than four, echoes, reflections of the moon in water, mere images, and conjugate conjurations what's that seven right uh, and says and phenomena are the same in being like a magician's illusions dreams optical illusions jimpa says mirages here it's more like uh optical illusions rather than mirages because mirages only refer to uh you know seeing a semblance of seeing water when there's no water, say in the desert and so forth. Optical illusion is, is probably better. Um, dreams, optical illusions, echoes, moons and water, reflections and emanations, or as Jimpa says, conjur conjurations. And finally, all phenomena uh, the, the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of the duality of real and unreal. Or as Anne says, the duality being uh, all phenomena are the, 
are the same in being without the duality of functioning things and non-functioning things. Shabbat says real and unreal. A big difference there in, in, in understanding. Uh, Jimba says, uh, so he's, he's, what they're doing is, Lama Sonkapa is quoting uh, the Dashabhumika Sutra as it was recorded in Chandrakirti's Majamaka Vatara. So Maj uh, Chandrakirti quoted this section from the Tenbhumi Sutra in his Majamaka Vatara. Lama Sonkapa is paraphrasing it a little bit. Uh, and at the end, he says, when that Bodhisattva who is entering into the sixth ground, when they realize the nature of all phenomena in such terms, because of their sharp and opposite forbearance, opposite forbearance, they will attain the sixth ground, namely the manifest. So does anyone know what, what that word means? A-P-P-O-S-I-T-E, apposite. Who is the English grammarian? Snehi looks like she has an answer. I do because I looked it up in the dictionary because I didn't know what it meant when I was reading it. It means appropriate, apt, highly pertinent. Right. So uh, Anne translates that, when in that way they thoroughly realize the nature of all phenomena through sharp and concordant forbearance, or as you said, as uh, Snehi suggested, maybe appropriate uh, patience, they attain the sixth bodhisattva ground, the manifest. Okay, so at least we've heard the words. So there are 10 things, 10 kinds of uh, samenesses or equalities that are talked about here. Some of them have more than one thing within them. So if you count up, there's there could be uh, more than ten altogether. So let's let's read on what Lama Sunkapa's commentary. So first of all, he's quoting that. Yeah, R Richard, you you first. Sorry, Venerable George, I just have a very quick question. I'm I'm not exactly sure what's meant by the absence of signs, and I was wondering if you would uh, uh, just briefly explain that. Yeah. So uh, it will come up, but. In brief, it means signs of inherent existence. Uh, so, uh, or, 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 or in general, uh, adhering to signs which are legitimate, like say, for instance, uh, the sign of something being blue is the aspect of that blue color. If you adhere to that as being inherently existent, that is what uh, the Bodhisattva who's entering into the sixth ground recognizes that all signs are not inherently existence. I think that's what's meant by absence of signs. But we'll have more detail because Lama Tsongkhapa is going to explain a little bit of what that means, right? We okay? Good to see. Good to see Amy. Amy, if I had hair, I'd, my hair would be whiter than yours. <laughs> Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Okay, so, like, so likewise, uh, uh, continuing after that quotation uh, in Jimpa's translation, likewise, where does that word come out, come in, uh, in their absence being in primordial, the freedom of elaboration, perfect Okay, it's, where did that the word likewise come in that temper? It's, it's in the on that page. On that little paragraph when the bodhisattva on the fifth ground enters, and then before number three, it says likewise. Right, right. Before three. Okay, after the first two. So the first two have some kind of um special sort of covering everything, and then the, the rest are sort of elaborations of that. So likewise, after the first two, before the third, indicates that the phrase perfect equanimity of phenomena must be extended up to in their absence of affirmation and rejection. These two, the absence of affirmation and rejection are a single perfect equanimity. So which one of the which one is that the perfect 
uh, freedom of elaboration, uh, the absence right. of the perfect equanimity of their absence of affirmation and rejection. So if you were just reading the list and you didn't have numbers before them, you might think affirmation and rejection were counted as two. So likewise indicates that the phrase, the perfect equanimity of all phenomena must be extended up to in their absence of affirmation and rejection. These two, the absence of affirmation and rejection, are a single perfect equanimity. Okay, that's easy. That's just when you're count. If you want to get ten, that's the way you have to count them. The equanimities in terms of phenomena's resemblance to the seven similes. I said analogies should be similes. I guess such as illusions should be taken as one perfect equanimity. So, what does that mean? We have these famous, um, there, and there are more similar similes to emptiness in the sut Prajraparamita Sutras. Um, the resemblance to illusions, you've heard that, right? Phenomena are like illusions. They're similar to illusions. They're not illusions because they do conventionally exist, but they are similar to illusions in that they don't exist the way that they appear. Right, perfect emity, uh, the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their resemblance to illusions, to dreams. That's another classic example that we talked about many times. In the dream, things seem so real, but they, when you wake up, you realize they're not. To mirages, or uh, what did Anne say here? To um, optical illusions. So not just, not limited to just mirages, but mirages is a kind of that illusion that something appears uh, because of some uh, conditions to the eye that cause one to, to uh, assume that things exist in a, in a certain way that they do not. Um, to dreams, I always said dreams, to mirages, to dreams, to dreams, to mirages, to echoes, so when you hear an echo, uh, you can sometimes be confused that what you're hearing is actually uh, sort of originated there, right? Where it is actually not. You, my famous example that I've given many times in previous classes when I was at, <laughs> when I was at Deer Park, late at night, maybe two in the morning, reciting mantra outside on the road. There was this dog across the road who used to always chase the cars. That's why its rear legs had been run over. It was sort of pulling those rear legs, barking at me. And every time it barked over here on my left, I would hear another dog bark on the right. And then after that, another dog a little over there. And I thought, man, that's strange. There's so many dogs out tonight responding to one another. It took me some time before I realized that what I thought were these other dogs barking from the right were just echoes of that dog from the left. You know, that you realize that they're not true in the way that you thought. You thought that they were being originated there by some dog or something like that. So that's kind of the sense of echoes to the reflections of the moon in water, or the text just says moons in water. So what that means is a famous example that we find many times also in the tantric texts. When you, uh, if you look at still body of water, uh, when the moon is out, uh, the moon is reflected in that and to the naive, maybe a deer who's there, might be fascinated or fixated upon the reflection, thinking that that's a real object down there. Um, so that's a very classic example. Also, you find in the Prajnaparamita Sutras as a simile of, of emptiness. Uh, to mirror images, uh, or as Anne says just directly, reflections. Uh, so... Although the moon in water is a kind of reflection, reflection here means like saying in a mirror, uh, seeing your face 
uh, or the, the parakeet who sees his or her face in the mirror. Any of you have parakeets who do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Paul? <laughs> no. I had a parakeet once that used to do that. So, you know, they're, they're snuggling up, to, thinking that there's another one they're snuggling up to in the reflection in the mirror. And to, as uh, Jimpa says, the last one, conjure conjurations, I want to say conjugations <laughs> from grammar, conjurations, or uh, as Anne says, uh, what, emanations. So say, for instance, if someone were to conjure or emanate uh, something, uh, like a bodhisattva, uh, one might think that it's a real thing, but is actually devoid of that. Okay, so let's continue. Likewise, uh, so where did we get... And the last two, I say, uh, the equanimities in terms of phenomena's resemblance to the seven similes, such as illusions, should be taken as one perfect equanimity. Okay, we just went through that. And the last two of real and unreal, or as Anne says, the last two, the sameness of being without the duality of things and non-things, are to be taken as one. Okay. Lama Sokapa's commentary continues, there seems to be some variance in the identity of the 10 perfect equanimities, the 10 samenesses, even between the commentary on the 10 ground sutra and the bodhisattva grounds. So what that's what is that referring to? Um, Vasubandhu, I think... This maybe and yeah, Vasubandhu wrote a commentary uh, to the Dashabhumika, but it's not from the Prasangika point of view. So even though it's a commentary on the Dashabhumika and and Chandra Kurti is quoting the Dashabhumika rather than the Bodhisattva Bhumi, which also talks about the ten samenesses. Um, the Bodhisattva Bhumi was written by whom? Do you, you know, Jennifer, do you know who Bodhisattva Bhumi was written by? Yeah. So, anyone? Asanga. Asanga. Yeah, it sounded like someone knowledgeable there. Who said that? Mm -hmm. Ah, so much. Okay. <laughs> so, Asanga, either uh, he heard about this from Maitreya in the and uh, in Tushita, when he was up there receiving the five texts, but the the Bodhisattva Bhumi is not considered one of those five texts, right? Or is it? No. Okay. So maybe his own his own text. So in that he's talking from the Chittamatra point of view. So he's talking about the the sameness is different. And Asanga, his brother, who wrote a commentary on the Dashabhumika, uh he was not talking about it from the present Kika point of view. So there is, so that's that's why Lama Sukhava says there seems to be some variance in the uh, difference in the identity of the 10 perfect samenesses or equanimities, even between the commentary on the 10 grounds by Vasubandhu and Asanga's Bodhisattva grounds. Since those two texts differ in their interpretation of emptiness from this tradition, meaning from the present Gika, the ten perfect equanimities are here explained in a matter distinct from them, not the same as as Vasubandhu described in his commentary to the Dashabhumika. So, like from Prasenkika point of view, not the correct, not explaining these things correctly, and not as the Bodhisattva grounds, uh, the Bodhisattva Bhumi uh, talked about. We're all together. It's all simple so far, just talking words so far, right? Of these 10 perfect equanimities, the first is that all phenomena are equal insofar as all these appearances of diverse signs do not exist from the perspective of the Arya's meditative equipoise. So what was the first one? The first one was perfect anonymity of all phenomena in their absence of signs, or you could say signless. So when we talk about the three doors of liberation, 
Have you heard of that expression, the three doors of liberation? Okay, Stephen, what are the three doors of liberation? Signlessness, wishlessness, and emptiness. I'm guessing <laughs> that last one. That's a good guess. That's that's right. Uh, sometimes in some tantric texts, they, they talk about a fourth door of liberation, like in a mandala has four doors, right? But that shouldn't, that's just an elaboration on that. So those are in the Buddha taught. Uh, so wishlessness, wishes are, are about things that happened in the past or will happen in the future. Anyone want to make a guess? Rochelle. The future. Future, right? Because you wish for things that have not yet happened. So wishlessness is talking about emptiness of, of future phenomena. Uh, signless is referring to uh, emptiness of things of the past. And emptiness is referring not only to the phenomena of the present, but also covers uh, the past and future also. So that's the same signlessness that's being talked about here. The first is that all phenomena are, are equal insofar as all these appearances of diverse signs. So like, like I mentioned to uh, one of you, I can't remember who said, like the sign, oh, Richard, the sign of blue or whatever, uh, they're not inherently existent. Uh, all these appearances of diverse signs do not exist from the perspective of the Arya's meditative equipoise. That means from that within the emptiness, uh, all of them are the same. All these signs disappear. So they're all the same in that, in that they're all empty. Okay. The second, what was the second? The perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of defining characteristics, or as Anne had said, what had she said? All is it, and being signless, all phenomena are the same in being characterlessness, characterless. Uh, so lacking character. So um, the second is the equanimity, Jimba's translation, the second is the equanimity of all phenomena insofar as they are devoid of existence by virtue of their intrinsic characteristics or uh, I think he's adding the word intrinsic there. Let me just see. And, and Anne's, uh, the second is that all phenomena are the same in being without establishment by way of their own character. So he says they're devoid of, Jimpa says they are devoid of existence by virtue of their intrinsic characteristics and says without they are without establishment by way of their own character so that has to be investigated this talking about uh what is their uh their nature they are not established by means of their own nature william what are you, what are you thinking I, I think since, since uh, he he says, I'm going to explain it in a different way, he's not referring to anything previously. I think that I think that these two explanations, the it refers to all phenomena in both of in both of those first two sentences there. And that from the meditative equipoise uh, uh, of a yogi, uh, that's the one. And the other one is from the. Uh, their own characteristics of, of all phenomena, not not from the yogic perspective, but perhaps from a conventional perspective. That's how I see it. It, it. It's not a continuation. It's saying, now I'm going to tell you the right way from the person. That's how, but maybe I'm, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Okay. You could be, okay, I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's let's determine by reading the text whether you're right or wrong. Uh, you could be right. Uh, so let's see. Um, 
Jimba says, of these 10 perfect equanimities, the first is that all phenomena are equal insofar as these appearances of diverse signs do not exist from the perspective of the Arya's meditative equipoise. The second is the equanimity of all phenomena insofar as they are devoid of, of existence by virtue of their intrinsic characteristics. These two represent a general presentation. So they apply to all 10, okay? The remaining eight, after those first two, present particular variations of the very truth thus explained in general. Or as Anne says, the other eight are taught in the context of making differentiations within the meaning of the general teaching. So diff you know, going into more detail, um, what does this say here? Differentiations. Thus, the remaining eight present particular variations of the very truth explained in general. For instance, Chimpa translates, the absence of birth or productionless, kewa mepa. Uh, so, for instance, when we talk, when you read about emptiness in some of uh, some of the traditions like Kargyu especially uh, they talk about uh, realizing that phenomena are unborn that's the same that's the same thing kewa mepa unborn phenomena are unborn unproduced it means they're not produced inherently and that's the first reasoning that Nargajuna will give in the text. We're in our in our maybe at the end of this class or the beginning of next class, we'll begin that first reasoning why phenomena are not inherently produced, not inherently born. So that's what's talking about here. Uh, Jimpa says, for instance, the absence of birth is from the perspective of the future, and unborn is from that of another temporal standpoint. Or as Anne says, productionless, kewa mepa, unborn, refers to future production. Because when you're talking about uh, things being produced, you're talking about the uh, the sprout uh, is not inherently produced from the seed. The seed being the standpoint of the present, the, the sprout does not come about from it. And non-produced, makepa, refers to the other times, the past and the present. When Jimpa says, uh, from other temporal standpoint, from another stem temporal standpoint, it means those two in particular, the past and the present. Okay, making sense? Maybe the two... Almost the two translations can help one another, like in some in some ways, like that. Then Jimpa continues that all phenomena are equanimous or equal uh, must be understood in the context of other remaining statements as well. What does that mean? G uh, and says voidness is an emptiness of the produced and the to be produced. Being void. So what is that, that statement? That all phenomena are equanimous or equal must be understood in the context of the other remaining statements. So wait, what Anne is saying there is that that these are the same or similar with respect to all phenomena also should be understood with respect to the other samenesses. Okay, so all of the other 10 refer to all phenomena. Okay. Then Jimpa says, being void, refers to being devoid of what is to be born and what is already born. These in turn must be understood in the sense of being absent of ex existence qualified by intrinsic characteristics. 
is stated in the context of the second perfect equanimity. Wow. Words can get kind of confusing here, right? What's it, what's it talking about? So Anne says, uh, let's go back. So this, this that phenomena are equal must be understood in the remaining statements as well. Being void refers to being devoid of what is to be born and what was already born. That sounds like the present and the future, right? Uh, so pre present and the past. These in turn must be understood in the sense of being absent of existence qualified by intrinsic characteristics. Let's unpack that a little bit. So, Anne says, voidness is an emptiness of the produced and the to be produced. The produced is the past, right? And the to be produced is the present, right? The past and the present. I.e., void of these as qualified as being established by way of their character, as in the context of the second sameness. Okay, Jimba continues, this fact too of being devoid of existence through in intrinsic characteristics is not something constructed by scripture or reason, rather they re remain so primordially, as primordially pure. This is the sixth. What is the sixth? We go back in the list. The sixth was their primordial purity, right? This fact, too, of being devoid of existence through intrinsic characteristics is not something constructed by scripture or reason. Rather, they remain so as primordially pure. This is the sixth. Or as, as Anne says, that such is not created adventitiously, by scriptures or reasoning, but that phenomena abide in such purity from the very beginning is the sixth. So what is this talking about? Well, before that, uh, Snehi, so you have you, you, your hand that's up and your hand on your head uh, indicated that you had. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time, Venerable George, uh, separating the difference between being un between absence of birth, being unborn, and being void. So let's go back. So was void, so when we talked about the absence of birth uh, was three. Being, yeah. Unborn, four. Five, being void so we're talking about those right so here um let's see let's go back to how ann talks about that productionless kewa mepa that's the first of those three refers to future production non-produced refers to the other times past and present that these are the same or similar with respect to all phenomena should also be understood with respect to other samenesses. Voidness, that's the third of those three, is an emptiness of the produced and the to be produced. Void of these as qualified by being established by way of their character as in the context of the second sameness. So this is talking about the third sameness but it's talk, it's talking about the it's it's talking about the voidness of the second sameness. Jennifer, I can't tell if you're if you're smiling <laughs> under your, your thing. <laughs> what do you think? Oh no, I <laughs> I was just trying to follow you. So you were saying it's void of the second sameness, which is the absence of intrinsic characteristic. No, it's Sorry, saying, was... it's a is saying uh let's see reading from Anne now okay because we're we're talking about these three 
Uh, in Jimpa's terminology, these three are uh, absence of birth, or as Anne translates, productionless, right? Jimpa says uh, they're same in being unborn. Uh, Anne translates that as non-produced. So productionless and non-produced are the uh, third and fourth. And then the fifth, Jimpa says, in being void, uh, and translated that as what? I have to go back. Just void. She, she said productionless, non-produced, void. So productionless, that's the, the third. Non-produced is the fourth. Void is the fifth. Okay, so productionless refers to future production and non-produced, the, the fourth, refers to, uh, what is it? Refers to the other two times, past and present, right? Void, which is the, 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 the fifth one, I guess. Voidness or void is an emptiness of the produced and the the to be produced. So that's the those are what are talked about in the second one, right? The second one was talking about uh, was called non-produced. That refers to the other times, past and present. That these are the same or similar with respect to all phenomena should be understood with respect to the other samenesses, so that they are not. Produced. Doesn't productionless doesn't productionless and not produce? I mean, they seem the same to me. It's talking about something that should have arisen, but did not. Like a like no future result came about. Well, yeah, but it means no inherently existent phenomena came about. Right. Has no phenomena come about. Still still phenomena are still produced. We're talking about we're not talking about things that failed to be produced at all. It means that they are not produced in the way that our minds are grasping at them. So kewa meba and makeba uh in this context are referring to different times. Uh when you say kewa meba that's the, the third one. Jimpa says absence of birth. Uh, that refers to future production. And Jimpa's unborn, uh, as Anne says, non-produced, refers to the other times, past and present. So the, the, first, the third one is talking about future things are not born. Uh, the... the other ones are talking about things that of the past were not produced and things of the present are not produced, non-produced, past and present. So voidness, the one that's in question here that uh, Snehi had her hand on her head and her hand up at the same time, that was like, what, what what's that talking about? This says, Voidness or void is an emptiness of the produced and the to be produced. In other words, i.e., void of these as qualified by being established by way of their own character, as in the context of the second sameness. Because the second sameness was talking about the, the first of the three samenesses. I want to say the second sameness, sorry. Second same is the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of defining characteristics. I guess that's what it's talking about here. I'm getting losing losing my place in the text. Qualified being established by way of their character as in the context of the second sameness. So the second sameness is not the um the second in the triad the second sameness, the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of defining characteristics, as Jimpa says, or as Anne's translation said, um, 
the second listen. What are the, all phenomena are the same in being signless? All phenomena are the same in being characterless. So that's the one that's being referred to here. Okay, let me get back to where we are. We'll we'll go over this again. Don't so, worry. Yeah, Adam, George, so for my understanding now, would it be correct to think that it means that of the phenomena of of the phenomena that is produced and to be produced, they should all be seen as being absent of defining characteristics. Well, yeah, all phenomena should be seen as absent okay. of defining characteristics, right? But but when when talking about these particular um, quotations from the Dashibhumika, let me just be, before I answer Suvash and Jennifer, let me let me just finish this this one section here. Um, where are we? Being void, Jimpa's translation, being void, quote unquote, refers to being void or devoid of what is to be born and what is already born. These in turn must be understood in the sense of being absent of, ex of existence qualified by intrinsic characteristics is stated in the context of the second perfect equanimity. Or as Anne says, voidness, what did Jimpa say? Being void. Voidness is an emptiness of the produced and the to be produced. In other words, void of these as qualified, that means that these are not in intrinsically qualified or inherently qualified as being established by way of their character as in the context of the second sameness. So the second sameness was talking about characterless. The phenomena are the same in being characterless. Um, and that sentence, then the, the last sentence says, it adds translation that that such is not created adventitiously by scripture or reasoning, but that phenomena abide in such purity from the very beginning is the sex is the sixth sameness. So what that means is that one might think that uh, emptiness that uh, phenomena become empty uh that they're not that they're not they're not empty from the beginning they're not primordially empty or not primordially pure but they only become so when a bodhisattva uses reasoning <laughs> to refute them and then they become empty you know that they're actually empty they're actually there they're actually intrinsically inherently existent but the bodhisattva, through their reasoning, caused them to become non-existent conventionally. That's not the case. In fact, that will come up many times again in the in the in the future. Uh, Suvaj. Uh, Venerable George, I actually have many questions, but but I'm just going to limit my 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 list. Okay. okay. Um, okay. I have many questions too, but yeah. When you, when you, so, so we've got a list of 10, right? And right. the first thing that struck me is, well, how does this relate to my experience when I sit and meditate? Okay. And there, and much, you already gave a response, right? That much of this is infused with the sense of um, intrinsic, intrinsic um, characteristics, which you, right. which, which is being denied, which is being rejected. Right. So Jimpus usually translates intrinsic. Uh, Jeffrey and Anne translate inherent uh, yeah. sometimes. So it's talking about the same thing. That's something existing from its own side, which is right. a particular uh, interpretation of the Prasangika from the 
Svatantrika point of view, things are intrinsically or inherently existent conventionally. They do, you can find something there. So that's that's a crucial point here. But but go on. Okay. Let's say, just for a minute, right? You're sitting in meditation and you, you're just meditating, right? Um, maybe even, you know, trying to do your, trying to do a clear light meditation. While you're in, while you're meditating, suddenly, right? From nowhere, a memory does arise. And the memory arose and you 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 saw that you know it was a memory of uh, say my mother right and um, you know um, let's say it was a good day and you didn't elaborate on it and the memory dissolved okay okay now here's my question for you is did the memory arise was it born or not born and two is did you notice its characteristic or you didn't notice? I mean, you, you, if, if you didn't recognize the, 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 the face, you know, without characteristics, how did you not recognize the face? Yeah. So those okay. are my two questions. Okay. So good, good question or questions, depending on how you enter it. So uh, what did your mother's, the appearance of your mother's face while you were otherwise meditating was that produced? That's your first question, right? Correct. Was produced conventionally. The, the problem is when we say our phenomena, uh, that phenomena are not produced, what we mean is that they are not produced inherently. So this is a, this is a, a distinction that's sometimes lost uh, because the context of Nargajuna debating with the lower schools is that everyone's position is that phenomena are, uh, although they may not use that language, are inherently produced. Uh, lower, some of the lower schools, they are truly ex uh, uh, produced. Svatantrika would say they're not truly produced, but they're still inherently produced conventionally. Prasangika says that phenomena are not inherently produced conventionally or ultimately, but they are they are conventionally produced. They're not they're, they don't it doesn't have to be an inherent or truly existent kind of production. So this that gets into uh, the what we're going to be talking about production. So the process of production going from, let's say, the seed to the sprout or the imprint in your mind to the memory of mom's face. Okay, so the mom's mom's face would be like the sprout that appearing in your your meditation and the the imprint in your mind is kind of like the seed that give gave rise to that, right? some cooperative conditions, either, uh, you know, something you were thinking about caused that memory to, to, to come to mind or whatever. But that production is not something that can be found anywhere. Uh, we're just talking about the production itself. That's an activity, right? That's a process. Like when we, when we do, when we talk about dedicating the emptiness of the three spheres, uh, in our dedication, the emptiness of the three spheres. So, uh, the the way that I divide them up, let's say the the merits to be dedicated, the objects to be dedicated to, and the act of dedication. So, the act of dedication you can't find anywhere. You know, it's just a name you give to that process of trying to connect these with that. But it is something that is conventionally accepted. In the same way the production of your mother's face or the production of the sprout is not something that can be found anywhere. It's not inherent. The production is not inherently existent. The production itself is just a conceptual imputation, which, which is valid and is, uh, say, 
validly established that that a sprout is produced from a seed conventionally. But when we talk about when because in the context of Nargajuna talking about uh, non-inherent production, when we say there is no there is no production, it's understood that that he's talking about no inherent production because all of the other people below Prasankika, when they talk about production, everything is is assumed that it is inherently existent production. How are we doing? Is it making sense? Where where did Suvash? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 here. Uh, yeah, really. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, I I follow you, but at that moment in in time, there's no sense of um, there's no sense of the word production. There's just a sense of something arising and ceasing. Yeah. Well, arising is produced for. It was it, there's no a, a, a inherent arisal. There is no inherent production. Correct. That means same thing. Correct. Correct. So there's no inherent production, right? But there is an arising of something that was not there from yeah, you know, before. Yeah, there is a production right? of something that was not there. The, the sprout yes. was not there. Your mother's face was not there a moment before. So Correct. it rises. It is produced conventionally. Conventionally. So uh, there are many dimensions of that. The production itself is not inherently existent, and the appearance itself is not inherently existent. So, if you're, yes. you're, it depends on what you're centering on. If we're talking about the process of how it arose, how it arose, how it, uh, um, what was the other word you said? How it was produced, and so forth. <laughs> you're talking about and the dissolve, process. right? Ar arise and dissolve. Yeah. Yeah. So, like in our meditation, when we say. Um, in our morning meditation, I say thoughts can uh, arise from the mind or be produced from the mind, or how do I say they appear from the mind and then they can absorb back into it, right? You know, like when you said you didn't pay attention, you weren't, uh, you didn't fortuitously, you didn't elaborate on it, on your mother's face. And so it faded away. Where did it fade away? It absorbed back into the consciousness. Right. right. So, uh, but the appearance of your mother's face uh, is different than the arisal or production of your mother's face. That is just, that is uh, an appearance to the consciousness, and that is not inherently existent either. Okay. Okay. Jennifer, you're patiently waiting there. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable George. Um, there is... Going back to number two, the absence of defining characteristics. So when you say the, the conventional nature of mind is clear and knowing, would that be would that be considered a defining characteristic of the mind? And then if so, could you share a little bit more, uh, I guess, <laughs> about the emptiness of that? Because it's hard to, you know, think that if it's not, there's some absolute nature of the mind that's clear and knowing how can we have these experiences and i'm, I'm getting a little so yeah, stuck when in that. we talk about when we talk about uh i'm not sure which of them use the word defining characteristics so uh say for instance uh what do i say hot and burning fire fire what are the defining characteristics of fire uh, it is that which is hot and burning. Usually the, in the Abhidharma uh, literature, in the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, each of the four elements have two defining characteristics. So one is it's uh, say hot and burning. One of it, one of them is its function. One of them is uh, its its experience. You know. Fire is that which is hot and burning. So those are like defining characteristics of fire. Those defining characteristics exist conventionally. That is, you can conventionally stick your hand on the stove <laughs> or in a fire. When I say on a, even on an electric stove, even if there's not a flame 
guess you Tetrick used to say that the, you know, like the coils of wire on the uh, and, and the rudimentary heater in his room uh, that was also considered uh, from the Buddhist point of view. That's also considered fire because it is hot and burning. You know, it is is able to burn if you drop some dust on it. That the dust bursts into flame and so forth. So those things are things that can be experienced conventionally and uh, they are known conventionally, but they do not inherently exist. Fire is not inherently hot. It is not inherently burning. And what that, to, to unravel what that means as opposed to conventionally hot and burning will take some time as we as we're trying to identify what inherent existence is. So for instance, the next section in our text is the identification of the object of negation. right So that that means identifying inherent existence. <laughs> not from the uh, Spatantrika point of view, not from the Chinamatra point of view, nor from the Sautrantika or the Vaibhashika, but from the Prasangika point of view. So we have to understand those other tenets to delineate what is being refuted here. So when we say the characters are not inherently existent, that may become more clear when we understand, when we identify what the, the characteristics of inherent existence are. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Go, go, oh no, go. thank you. <laughs> so maybe, yeah, maybe this is jumping the gun then. But if we're looking at the nature of mind as clear and knowing first, is that an accurate statement? Can one say the conventional nature of mind is clear and knowing? I guess, you know, if something isn't in, in, and if all sentient beings have mind, then I'm just having the hard time making like I could sort of see fire being hot and burning only conventionally but for the mind to be clear and knowing only conventionally is harder for me because all sin all beings possess mind yeah, yeah. so um the alternative to being clear and knowing only existing conventionally would be that clear and knowing exist ultimately I'll let that sink in. I try to cage by your face whether you're following. So you're saying it's hard to accept that a clear and knowing only exists conventionally. What would be the alternative? Would be that clear and knowing <laughs> exists ultimately, right? So if it existed ultimately, it would never change. Uh, it would be permanent. So the uh, knowing of something would always be present, whether you would know anything you'd ever known would always be known now. Uh, and those things that you had not known before would never be able to be accessed because they are, because knowing is inherently existent and so forth. So there are many, many uh, ways that we can refute the possibility of inherent existence. So that's that's going to be coming up when we, oh, this is like the good portion of the sixth chapter talking about this. What, it, what would it mean if phenomena existed the way that they appeared? So the way that they appear is that they are existing inherently, existing from their own side without the need of imputation upon them that the tree outside or the clear and knowing of the mind is sort of just blasting from its own side without the need of an observer, without the need of an imputation and so forth. Thank you. I think then my next question would be, well, the object of knowing can always be changing, but the actual act of knowing, isn't that like um, a persistent phenomena across life and death so persistent uh, and permanent are different right say for instance when we talked about 
uh, the meaning of permanence. From a Buddhist perspective, permanence means not changing moment by moment. Consciousness or perception changes moment by moment. So it is not it is not permanent. It is impermanent. Uh, but it is the word that sometimes we use before is eternal. So consciousness is eternal, <laughs> or as you said, persistent. Uh, but it is not. It is not permanent. There's a difference between persistence, as, as you'd like to put, call it, and uh, permanence. Okay, th think about it. Think about it. This is a good. You, you and Paul can debate over uh, sushi this afternoon. Okay. And I'm just assuming that's what New Yorkers have for lunch. Okay. There was someone else had their their hand up before one. John, you have a question. I do. Um. Uh. And but I I. It, Feel free to, you know, say that we don't really need to be talking about it. I, I wanted to, um, I was trying to figure out uh, for myself, like the difference between uh, the, I guess it's, uh, what is it, numbers, what it, it, it the, the, how, how Tupin Jimpa is translating absence of birth, being unborn, and, and is, translating right uh productionless non-produced and then moving on to the the fifth in in being void and mm -hmm. then there there's a qualification and then i went back to check what the uh, the tibetan was saying and it's really interesting that the, the tibetan is that what they're translating as this this fifth uh equanimity or equality is being void it actually says wemba um and emba, then, yeah emba so and, Emba, like say, like uh, Enzampa, uh, famous guru. So Emba means isolated. So uh, general, neither of them translated it as that. It's good that you pointed that out. So uh, generally Emba, like, like say, for instance, uh, the definition of a gomba. Do you know what a gomba is? A uh, monastery? Yeah, kind of. Usually we, we call the monastery gomba or the, the temple gompa, but gompa actually means uh, a, a, a structure which is enpa, which is isolated. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That means isolated a certain distance from the town. It has to be in a certain number of arm spans <laughs> before it can be called a gompa. It has to be isolated. So isolated usually means separated from, or mm -hmm. in this case, they're translating it as devoid. I think Jimpa said devoid right what did he, he says say? he says absent at some point in this term oh no i don't have all yeah so he said uh, the fifth one he said in being void so the third one in their absence of birth that's not the the same that doesn't have the word empa in it in their being unborn and in being void in tibetan those are uh kewa mepa that that's that's sort of like unborn or unproduced makepa and then emba so in tibetan there's a dao prefix um with a bao then bode da uh was it what's the final syllable there e, na en enpa so, uh, or you, you know, as you tried, as you were pronouncing it, Wemba, sometimes in, in uh, actually in Lhasa dialect, supposedly, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, in, in Lhasa dialect, usually they don't say Wemba, they say Empa, right? Or am I wrong? Uh, you know, I've heard it both ways. I, I always learned it as Wempa, but, you know, Geshe Tanda was from Tsang, not Lhasa. So, yeah, right. So <laughs> generally Lhasa, they don't, they don't put that, they don't say Wempa, as I understand it. So anyway, the, the meaning is isolated. And in this context, uh, both Anne and uh, Jimpa are translating it as void. Let's see, well, how did Anne translate it? All phenomena are like production is not produced void. But it's not like tongba, it's empa. That means it is it's a it, it is isolated from 
is a, is far away from inherent existence. You could say that way. Mm. You know, it's like it's, like, it's completely it, it's completely uh, uh, isolated from insulated from inherent existence. However, you and, want to. Say. And then, is it correct that the the comment uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's comment is that it is isolated or void in the sense of the second sameness by being. Uh, isolated from being qualified uh, as um, uh, intrinsically produced by its own, by character. Well, the second is the perfect equanimity of all phenomena in their absence of defining characteristics. So in that list of 10. Right, that's the second. That's the second. And and this number five of voidness is that I'm reading it. Then is a it refers this in turn must be understood in the sense of being absent of existence, qualified by intrinsic characteristics, as stated in context of the second perfect equanimity. So he's he's just he's <laughs> specifying that the way in which it is uh, emba is that way described in the second equanimity. Okay, so that correct. interestingly, I had thought that this is a section we would get through very quickly. <laughs> obviously, it's, it's something that uh, can be confusing and rightly so. So I was, uh, uh, but let's, let's go into it. William, you, you want, you have some clarification you'd like to make? I'd just like to go back uh, in these first two again that keep being referred to. It says, concerning that, the first sameness is that all phenomena are similar to the that appearance of their dissimilar characteristics does not exist in the perspective of a superior's meditative equipoise. Right. Okay, so from the point of view of a superior, no phenomena exist inherently. Now we have left conventional reality, or we have left we have left then, how do we explain? You, you, you never use the word dependently originated, but the second one is, the second is that all phenomena are the same in being without establishment by way of their own character. You're reading Anne, are, right? Yes, I, 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 I get, I'd rather read the similar to what I know. Yeah, These yeah. two are the general teaching. These two are, the general teaching. So these first two, this paragraph is the general teaching. The other eight are taught in the context of making differentiations within the meaning of the general teaching itself. In other words, these first two things, uh, Tsongkhapa is, is bringing together, either it's empty through the equipoise of a, of a superior, or it's empty through not having, through, I would say, but you don't seem to say through dependent origination uh, that that through they don't have their own characteristics. Another way of saying they have a dependent origination or dependent characteristics. And these two either I see it as empty meditative equipoise as a superior, or I see it as not established. Uh, this is a problem with the Prajnaparamita. It seems to me is that we read these things. And because of our tendency to say inherently existent, even when it says unborn, unceasing, that means not inherently born, not inherently ceasing. So all of According these things. To the first, right, right. According to Prasad I mean, within what I consider, I don't, I so only learn. From, I only from learn my point of view, it's not a problem with the Prajnaparamita. It's a problem with our mind, not yeah. understanding what the Prajnaparamita Praj Prajna Paramita is saying. So to say that it's a problem with the Prajna Paramita sounds a little bit disparaging well, of the no 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 uh, I mean of the in, Prajna in Paramita it, like, we tend to reify. Didn't, didn't do in, a good in job it, to reify. Okay. In, okay. In the reading of it, we tend to reify it. But right. here he's and but the second way of being without own characteristic is to be of dependent characteristic, a, a dependent. Like, like there is no 
right, right. You said you said that several times. So let's uh, let's leave that for the time being, and we'll investigate to see if that's indeed what those first two mean. That the first refers to uh, meditative equipoise, and the second refers to non-meditative equipoise. Let's wait and see. Okay. So let's let's continue a little bit further. Thank you. Yeah. So um, where were we? Uh, okay. I'm not sure. I think in Jimpa's text, yeah, I got to the point that this fact too of being devoid of existence through intrinsic characteristics is not something constructed by scripture or reason, whether they remain so or they you know, they abide as primordially pure. That means phenomena are not made to be inherently existent, that, you know, that they were not originally inherent existence, but they were made that way, nor that they are uh, inherently existent and that inherent existence is destroyed by reasoning. That's not the, that's not the case. Okay, that's the sixth one. The seventh... Let me get up to similar pages in these two. The seventh, the absence of dualistic elaboration should be correlated to the first equanimity. Okay, uh, William. So you were, you were, you're, uh, you're, uh, your, your stronghold here is the first and second, right? So the seventh is the absence of dualistic elaboration. The seventh comma, the absence of dualistic elaboration, should be correlated to the first equanimity, while the freedom of elaboration of language and conceptualization should be correlated to the second equanimity. Maybe you'd read ahead, okay? So um, let me see here. In Anne's text, she's saying... Uh, where's the seventh? The seventh sameness, that all phenomena are the same in lacking the elaboration of dualistic appearance, applies to the first, the sameness in the sense of being that way in meditative equipoise on suchness, right? So there's no dualistic, they're the same in lacking the elaboration of dualistic appearance. So elaboration here doesn't always mean conceptual uh, elaboration, like thinking about something, but it it, it can mean that the, the phenomena appear uh, to be inherently existent. For instance, when you're not in meditative equipoise on emptiness, when you're not, I'm sorry, when you're not in direct realization, meditative equi uh, equanimity, which is directly realizing emptiness, there is a, the phenomena appears to you to be inherently existent because what is appearing to you is the generic image, the dunshi, or the mental image, which looks to be inherently existent. But you, what you're knowing is that it is lacking inherent existence. You're still realizing the lack of inherent existence in that meditative equipoise. So the seventh... In reading Chimpa, the seventh, the absence of dualistic elaboration should be correlated to the first equanimity. And Anne said, the seventh, sameness that all phenomena are the same and lacking the elaboration of dualistic appearance applies to the first, that is, the sameness in the sense of being that way, lacking dualistic appearance, in meditative equipoise on suchness. Because in meditative equipoise on suchness, She doesn't say she doesn't add the word direct here or aria, but it, it means that when you're realizing it directly in meditative equipoise, there is no appearance uh, of anything conventional at all. Only thing that appears is emptiness. Okay, and and, and continues whereas that all phenomena are the same in being unelaborated by terms and thoughts should be affixed with a qualification of the second, that is, 
the sameness in the sense that all phenomena are the same in that they're being elaborated by terms and thoughts is not established by way of its own character. Such qualification should also be applied to the eighth suchness, uh, eighth sameness, that all phenomena are the same and not involving adopting and discarding that exist by way of their own characters. The ninth sameness is many forms of examples for ascertaining the meanings explained earlier. The tenth sameness is the similarity of all phenomena in not being inherently existent as things or non-things. As Jimpa had said, uh, rather than saying things and non-things, he said, um, the ninth consists of numerous analogies to help the astronomy. The tenth refers to the fact that whatever the phenomena are, whatever the phenomena, all are the same and lacking intrinsic existence in terms of the duality of real versus unreal. And says thing and non-thing. So this is a little bit different. Um, okay, so... It's good that you brought up these questions, uh, but I had, uh, when Geshe Zopa taught, he taught very quickly because he wanted to get on to the sort of like the the meat <laughs> or the tofu. The, 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 what, what, when you buy tofu, you can get the soft, the medium, or the hard or extra hard or stiff or whatever it's called. Was it, uh, you know, the kind of like the meat. What was that famous in politics some years ago? Uh, uh, where's the meat? I think it was a long, maybe those who follow elections don't remember that. There's no meat on dry bones. Okay, good. Uh, Sean just right, said. So uh, let's just let's just re go a little bit further, and then we'll uh, I'll stop and we'll go back to some questions, and then I'll ask you to think about this. Uh, we'll have discussion group on Monday. Uh, we'll have you have a chance to think about it, read about it in the week. Go back and forth and take up William's suggestion that. Uh, the first and second are are talking about, um, you know, meditative equipoise on emptiness, or uh, and the second is talking about the non-meditative equipoise. That seems to be his suggestion. But let's let's continue a little bit further. So the text in Jimpa's text, he continues, a uh, quote sharp unquote, refers to swift intelligence. Whereas opposite, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, opposite, opposite refers to forbearance toward the unborn nature commensurate with that of the eighth ground. Oh, Chimpas sometimes his terminology makes him <laughs> it's difficult for me to understand. So uh, Anne translates that as sharp. So this is usually numba. Uh, you know, like the like a thorn is sharp or something like that. It also refers to intelligence, right? When we talk about sharp intelligence or dull intelligence, say, oh man, that, that guy is really sharp or that, that gal is really sharp or that guy is really dull or something. Uh, she says sharp refers to the quickness of wisdom and concordant or as... Jimpa says, apposite means concordant with an eight, eighth ground bodhisattva's patience, forbearance, with respect to the doctrine of non-production. Okay, so what's that talking about? So generally, when we talk about patience, uh, there are different kinds of, of patience, things that, you know, being patient or being having forbearance toward uh, suffering, uh, having forbearance or patience, not to retaliate, uh, different kinds of patience. One of them is the patience uh, 
uh, what we call Dharma patients. So Dharma patients, uh, although there's some context when it refers to a certain level of the path of seeing, when you talk about Dharma patients, but generally Dharma patients means um, putting up with the difficulty in understanding emptiness and not getting frustrated so that you get angry. Right? <laughs> ah, emptiness! Uh, so here, uh, as Anne says, let me read again. Sharp refers to quickness of wisdom. So this is talking about, uh, let's go back again. So after the 10th e equalness or equanimity or sameness, uh, the quotation from the Dashabhumika said, when that fifth ground bodhisattva, when he, that means the fifth ground bodhisattva who's transitioning to the sixth ground, realizes the nature of all phenomena in such terms because of his or her sharp and opposite forbearance, he will attain, he or she will attain the sixth ground, namely the manifest. So this is not talking about one of the 10 samenesses or equanimities, this is talking about a quality, that bodhisattva's quality, so that they have sharp refers to their swift intelligence, quick intelligence. Like when you do the Manjushri, yellow, uh, red, yellow Manjushri, different kinds of wisdom. One of them is called sharp or quick wisdom, you know, that you understand things quickly. Um, so that's referring to that, where, where whereas opposite or concordant uh, quality of their mind means concordant with an eighth ground bodhisattva's forbearance with respect to the doctrine of non-production. So that means it's similar to, uh, it's leading that way. It's not the same as the eighth ground bodhisattva's uh, forbearance with respect to the doctrine of non-production. So the doctrine of non-production means that phenomena are not inherently produced, right? Difficult to understand, easily to get, easy to get frustrated about. And uh, so one needs that special kind of forbearance to, pers you know, uh, perseverance is another perfection, but that, that forbearance that doesn't get hindered by that you know that that allows you to have perseverance and to continue on um that's what's being talked about so the eighth ground bodhisattva is on the one of the three pure grounds right so that point the eighth ground bodhisattva is now a mahayana arhat they've eliminated all of the delusions so they no longer uh have to have uh you know, they, they they don't need that forbearance uh, with respect to the doctrine of non-production because they completely accept that. So this sixth ground, or the fifth ground bodhisattva going on to the sixth has something similar to that, concordant with that, or as generally <laughs> like it's a, a positive with that. Uh, it's not the actual eighth ground bodhisattva's uh, forbearance with respect to the doctrine of non-production, but it's something concordant with that, similar to that. Okay, making sense? How are we doing? And then uh, Lama Sokaba says, there, appear, there appears to be various types of a positive forbearance depending upon the context. Or as Anne says, there appears, there appear, Shimpa says there appears with an S at the end. She says there appear, that seems better grammar to me. There appear to be many different interpretations of concordant forbearance due to different contexts. That is, she puts in parentheses there in brackets, that is, due to its being explained in the context 
of different Bodhis on the different Bodhisattva grounds. Okay. And then just to finish that section, although many scriptures teach the suchness of phenomena, the context here is the explanation of how the wisdom of the sixth ground realizes suchness. So the context here is the fifth grounder entering the sixth ground enters by means of these. So that means they're qualities that the sixth grounder has, right? So although many scriptures teach that such is a phenomenon, the context here is the explanation of how the wisdom of the sixth ground realizes suchness. You know, how it initially, so it's seeing everything um, equal in one sense, uh, that they're all empty of inherent existence, uh, it has that certainty. Of course, even on the first ground, the Bodhisattva uh, realized in meditative equipoise and in post-meditation that all phenomena are equal and not being inherently existent. But this is this is more expansive now. Thus, the citation here from Dashabhumika is from the scripture that states how the Bodhisattva enters the sixth ground by means of the ten perfect equanimities, or as Anne says, Although there are many scriptures that teach the suchness of phenomena, the explanation here is in the context of describing how suchness is realized by a six-round bodhisattva's wisdom. Hence, Chandra Kirti cited a scripture. So when Jim says the citation, she's, she's pointing out it's Chandra Kirti who cited the Dashibhumaka that describes entry into the sixth ground by way of the ten samenesses. Whoa. Uh, Snehi, headache? No. Uh, Nadine, did, did this give you a headache or did it clear away your headache? Quite difficult. When I read ahead, I thought, oh, how difficult must it be to explain that? Must <laughs> uh, explain <laughs> so difficult. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's it's only difficult when when one has good students like you guys to uh, have questions and doubts and to point up things like that. Okay, so we're going to um, begin next time with this section identifying the forces opposing the understanding of suchness, or in Anne's text, identifying what is discordant with knowing suchness discordant, opposing. So this brings up the famous a quotation from the Bodhisattva Charya Vatara. Let, let me read that. Um, in Just after, it says, in setting forth all phenomena is devoid of true existence, if one does not understand well what constitutes true existence, or in the context of Prasankika, what constitutes intrinsic existence or in inherent existence, and what constitutes grasping a true existence, you know, the, the what appears to you is the appearance of, of true existence, the appearance of inherent existence, and how you respond to that is you're grasping on that. If you don't identify those, if one don't, if one does not understand well what constitutes what constitutes true existence, what constitutes grasping your true existence, one's view of emptiness will certainly go astray. And also uses the word astray. So this is a quotation from Shantideva, which is, which other traditions, say Kargyu, Nyingma, Sakya, many of them say, oh, Lama Sokapa's completely blown it here. That's not what it means at all. Here, the text doesn't bring up any of that because most of the those criticisms came after Lama Sokapa wrote this, right? But uh, we'll, we'll go into a little bit about that. Uh, did John have to leave? Is John still here? Oh, John's here, but did Paul leave? Yeah, Paul left. So John, are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with, yeah, the pylon that occurs after. <laughs> so this is a famous, a famous thing. So this is how Lama Tsongkhapa uh, interprets this line from 
Bodhisattvacharya Vatara. In fact, in the Snehi, it might be interesting to see in the list that Serko and Rupeshe gave from his guru, uh, Tenzin Darge, or no, Tenzin Gurme, whether this verse is in there. This is um, from the ninth chapter, verse 140. So Jimpa translates it, without touching upon the imputed entity, the absence of its reality cannot be grasped. Or as Anne translates it, without making contact, Jimpa said touching, without making contact with the thing imputed, Jimpa said imputed entity, by the mind that is true existence, the non-existence of that thing is not apprehended. Jimpa says cannot be grasped. So the idea is that unless you can identify what you want to negate, any kind of words or reasoning you use won't actually touch that and won't touch the grasping that's believing it. So from the from the Prasangika perspective of Lama Sunkapa, this is perfectly correctly uh, acceptable. And I think you'll find it convincing also, but you just to be aware that that's one of the uh, points of contention with some of the other traditions, uh, people claiming that this doesn't talk about identifying the object of negation, mainly because there, some of the other traditions are saying <clears throat> you don't necessarily have to use analysis to establish emptiness in this way. Anyway, I'll leave it like that. So that's sort of like a uh, what do you call it? What, what do you have before the the main meal? Orders. <laughs> the order, yeah, like the orders or appetit. What is it in Italian? Uh, appetizers. Appetizers or something. I, I can't remember the Italian term. So that's kind of like just to get your taste buds going. So you might do some research on that if you have uh, texts of some of the other traditions. You might investigate that. So. Um, any questions? <laughs> William. Just what page is that on this, this section that you went forward to in Anne Klein's book? So uh, this is on page 165 in Anne Klein's book. Okay, one, so about two 163, yeah. this chapter that we were discussing is called in Anne Klein's book, Dependent Arising and Reality. Right. So I... That's the reason I'm a little confused why we didn't talk at all about dependent arising. So both the, her title and Jimpa's title, Jimpa's title to this section was identifying the object of negation. Jimpa's title doesn't refer to this section. That's just something going on that's coming later, identifying the object of negation. Anne is just giving a, for the book her own title to this section. This section is actually called The Presentation of How Suchness of Dependent Arising is Explained. You can see that right below her title in, on page 163, the dep Dependent Arising in Reality, right below that, the text, smaller print says, The Presentation of How the Suchness of Dependent Arising is Explained has three parts. So that's the name in the outline before this, that's the name of this section the presentation uh, of how the suchness of dependent arising is explained. So she's just put a generic title above that sort of to cover this, okay? Okay, any other question? KT. In the opening, um, setting our intentions with Geshe Sopa's quote, what um, verse was that from Aryadeva's 400 verses? That is verse 350 of the 400. It's the last verse of chapter 14, which is entitled Refuting Extreme Conceptions. So obviously chapter 14 is not the last chapter of the, so the, the 400 stanzas, stanzas are broken up into chapters. 
And if you just count from the beginning, there are 400 or maybe there are 401 or 202 stanzas. It's, it's essentially 400 stanzas. So this, the verse that we had at the beginning in the motivation was the 350th. So there's still 50 more verses after that in the 15th and succeeding chapters of the 400. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Ida? Have you had any? Uh... Oh, Amy. Amy has a question. Amy has a question. Just, I, I missed the page in in Tukton Jimba's book. Uh, so I don't have the hard bone. Who can tell us the identifying the? Um, I'm sorry. One seventy three. What is it? One one seventy three. Thank you. Thanks. So that would be. Let me just get back to that. That would be what? The seventh after that would be the page upon which this next thing we're going to do, identifying the forces opposing the understanding of suchness. That would be that page, right? 173. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me just put that down here so I can repeat it next time to people. Jimpa. 173 and Klein. What did I just say? Uh, 165. 165, yeah. 165. Okay. So you have those both. Thank you. Um, any last questions, Subhash? You okay? Okay. Sean? Um, uh, I'm you, good. You're good. <laughs> uh, Richard just had to leave. Uh, Ida has a question. Is compassion a mental factor, Venerable? Is compassion a mental factor? Uh, who who wants to make a stab at that? Some of our low rig students. Don, is compassion a mental factor? Yes, I think it is. Yes. The mental Which factor. one is it? Is it called compassion among the mental factors? I'm not not sure of that. Or is it a mind? And not well, it's not a primary mind. It's not a primary mind. Nadine, what do you think? I think it's not listed among the virtuous mental factors, but it is still a, a mental factor. So among the virtuous mental factors, is there one called ahimsa, non-harmfulness? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so that's identical with compassion. Ah, yeah. Right? Uh, because compassion it's... wants sentient beings to be free of suffering, doesn't want to inflict harm upon them and so forth. So generally, <clears throat> generally we'd say compassion is a mental factor it's not a primary mind. When we, when you say mind and mental factors, <clears throat> the mind that's referred to is means primary mind as opposed to secondary mind, right? Secondary minds <clears throat> are <clears throat> sorry. Primary minds <clears throat> take the general characteristic of the perceptual field and hold it in mind. The, the mental factors are that which discriminates the various uh, particularities of the perceptual field. So compassion is a mental factor. Okay. So um, the mind of wisdom would be a primary mind. <laughs> is uh, so wisdom that you're talking about is the mental factor called prajna or sherab in Tibetan. That is a mental factor in general. So uh, a mental a mental consciousness <clears throat> in which uh, the wisdom realizing emptiness is present 
uh, that can take on the characteristic of that wisdom because it shares the five similarities. So minds, primary minds and their mental factors share five similarities. They have the same object, they have the same way of grasping it and so forth, have the same duration. Um, so there would be a primary consciousness within which that mental factor is present, but that mental fact, that mental consciousness, that primary mental consciousness is not called wisdom. It's mental fact, a mental factor that's present in that, that mental consciousness, um, the mental factor, prajna or sherab, wisdom, is the wisdom. So it's a mental factor also, because it distinguishes one thing from another. It distinguishes the, the particularities of the perceptual field. I'm trying to get this um, to this in information that I found on Klein's uh, page 39 on the introduction, okay. where it says that uh, whatever, whatever is a consciousness of meditative equipoise on emptiness, directly cognizing emptiness, means that whatever is one entity with that mind, for example, virtuous mental factors like faith, consciousness, and so forth, are also said to directly cognize emptiness. Yeah. So it means that there are 23 mental factors in all that directly cognize emptiness. I'm trying to and, get to page 39 to see what, yeah. you're, what you're saying there. So yeah, there's no so you're do you see a contradiction then to what we were just saying? Well, uh, it's hard for me to understand that for for example, faith is can cognize emptiness directly and compassion cannot. <laughs> Why can't can compassion? I, that's what I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, faith, shame, embarrassment, non-attachment, non-hatred, uh, aspiration, mindfulness, belief, all those factors can directly cognize emptiness and, con and compassion cannot. It's just something that I still cannot yeah, I'm just getting the understand. page. So where is that on that page? Where is it beginning or where on page? Uh, it's at the the third second paragraph third paragraph i believe it starts with res with respect to the second part of the etymology okay so etymology uh with respect to the second part of the etymology to say quote whatever is a consciousness of meditative equipoise on emptiness directly cognizes emptiness Whatever is a consciousness of meditative equipoise on emptiness directly cognizes emptiness means that whatever is one entity with that mind, for example, <laughs> virtuous mental factors like faith, conscientiousness, and so forth, is also said to directly recognize emptiness. So just as a, an aside, would... Um, Compassion be present when cognizing emptiness directly? Would it be manifest? Not necessarily, no. That would be... Well, uh, I, I, I would put it the other way. It would necessarily not be there. Because compassion is a mind that thinks, that has a conceptual, conceptualizing uh, aspect thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if sentient beings were free of suffering? So there is no, in a direct realization of emptiness, that kind of mental factor would not be there. But faith, conscientiousness, and she says, and so forth, there are others that can be there. Like in that meditative equipoise on emptiness, uh, there would be faith present not as a conceptualizing mind, but one which say the faith of clarity and so forth. What do we say? Clear faith. There, there you know, there 
uh, three kinds of faith, right? That would be there. Uh, and so because they are part of the entourage, uh, let's say in that sense, because the prajna, the mental factor is realizing emptiness, the, the mental factor of wisdom is realizing emptiness. The primary mind within which it shares five similarities would also said to be re directly realizing emptiness. Why not all the other mental factors? Because some of them depend upon some kind of conceptualization like compassion. Compassion and bodhicitta are still uh, it's an argument between the different monastic colleges in Tibet, like Sarah and Drebung and so forth. They would say uh, compassion is, some would say compassion is present. Some would say that it is not present, but uh, it, it is there uh, as a seed and it is unmanifest. But it, generally, I think they'd all say that compassion is not manifest when you have a direct realization of emptiness. So it wouldn't fall into that category uh, that these other mental factors like faith. Faith is sort of, uh, because faith is present in that mind, virtuous mental factor. I want to say also the omnipresent mental factors, they're all present in that direct realization of emptiness, right? All of those could like, contact and and so forth. All of those could be said to be directly realizing emptiness only in the sense like, uh, say, uh, we accompanied Lama Zopa to meet the president or the Dalai Lama or something. And the Dalai Lama spoke to Lama Zopa and we were in his entourage so we could say we met with the Dalai Lama, you know, because we're we're in the entourage. Does that does that sound feasible to you? So it's the, these other ones. It's not as though they are knowing uh, by their own power emptiness. They are knowing emptiness by the power of the the wisdom with with. Within whose within whose entourage they exist. So, um, investigation and analysis is also can uh, directly cognize emptiness. Does it say that there? Because there's no there's no. Uh, They're the two unchangeable men mental. Yeah, no, they they are not present in that direct realization of emptiness right because they ref they in they necessitate some conceptualization thinking is it like this is it like that it's not like this it's like that so there's no thinking going on in the direct realization of emptiness some okay. we established that there's also non conceptual analysis correct no, we we said there is non-conceptual vipassana. Remember, people were trying to force that vipassana meant analysis. I said when you have a direct realization of emptiness, vipassana is no longer analyzing. It takes on it's still present, but it takes on the aspect of being wisdom. Do you remember that discussion? Yes. So it will be non-conceptual analytical meditation if you want it better to say non-conceptual vipassana because analytical meditation still sounds like analysis so vipassana uh, means uh, in tibetan we say lak tong tong just means see right lak means higher higher seeing or penetrative insight uh, okay good question uh, let's leave it there. Otherwise, some of you are going to be falling down. I think Nadine, with her headache, may be uh, getting more of a headache. So um, we'll continue next week. If um, 
Has Sheila still here? Maybe she's gone. Oh, Sheila's still here. Sheila, can you put up the uh, the final prayers? Or maybe she's she's off having a cup. Oh, there she is. Okay. So just go beyond that. We'll say the um, dedication prayer after that. Gewadi Nyurduda Lama Sange Trubgyurne Droa Chikyang Malupa Dei Sala Kupasho Chang Chub Sem Chog Rimboche Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyurche Ke Panyam Pa Me Payang Gone Gong Du then prayer for the swift return of Lama Zopa Rinpoche, peerless teacher and assembly of children of the victorious ones, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas, victorious Losang father and sons, together with your lineage, all objects of refuge of the infinite realms, please bestow now the virtue and goodness to accomplish this prayer. In holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings through explanation and practice, you wore the armor of patience. Oh, so like today, the patience of, uh, you know, the patience of uh, investigating <laughs> emptiness and so forth, the, the Dharma, the Dharma patience that we were talking about. You wore the armor of patience that is never discouraged incomparable venerable guru to you make i make request soul gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge while striving exclusively for the welfare of the victorious one's teachings and for the welfare of mother living beings you suddenly departed to peace at this my mind was distraught nevertheless through the undeceiving truth of the blessings the oceanic blessings of the three jewels and the great waves of the mind generation, the bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones, may the smile of the new re reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for fortunate disciples. I can imagine Lama Zopas, you know, Tuku <laughs> beaming with a big smile in front of us. <laughs> and then for all of our spiritual teachers, you who are my eyes for viewing all the infinite scriptures, the supreme gateway for the fortunate ones traveling to liberation, engaging as you do with skillful means moved by mercy, all illuminating spiritual friends, please live a long and stable life. And in, in so we say, Dor Duna, in, in brief, think, you know, whatever merits I've accumulated today in the past and the future, whatever the merits that all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Shravakas, Pratika Buddhas have accumulated, uh, all living beings, I dedicate them to the great enlightenment of all sentient beings. And sealing those dedications in the emptiness of the three spheres the merits, the objects dedicated to, and the action of dedication are all empty of inherent existence. They all appear conventionally. They, can, they are conventionally consistent, but they do not exist the way that they appear as inherently existent. So thank you to you stalwarts who... <laughs> remain to the to the uh, end uh look forward to seeing some of you on monday and uh, hopefully all of you next saturday have a good week take care thank, thank you, you. Thank, yeah. you so thank you so much thank you sheila bye bye